Good evening, good afternoon, everyone joining here today for the webinar, Ukraine Crisis, which is the cause, Russia or US NATO? We're just gonna give about two minutes for people to join in the webinar before we begin tonight. Thank you. Francophone, je m'appelle Tamara Hansen. Je travaille ici à Vancouver avec Allison et le mouvement Fire This Time. Uh, on veut juste vous dire que l'interprétation est ouverte. Um, et si vous regardez le petit globe uh, en bas de votre écran, uh, ça dit interprétation. Si vous poussez là, vous pouvez rejoindre la salle de interprétation en français. On va aussi mettre ces instructions dans le chat. Uh, merci d'être venu aujourd'hui. Thank you, Tamara Hansen. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us here tonight. Uh, to uh, repeat what Tamara said in, in English, she was giving people the instructions in French for how to join the interpretation function for this simultaneously translated webinar. So if you are going to be participating today in English, uh, please go to the bottom of your screen. There should be a globe icon that says interpretation. You enter uh, interpretation by pressing that globe, choose your lang language you would like to listen in, English or French, and then choose the option to mute original audio for a better listening experience. These questions, or this instruction will also be posted into the chat tonight. And a big thank you again to our interpreters uh, here today. Welcome to today's webinar, Ukraine Crisis. What is the cause, Russia or US NATO? What is at stake? We are here today to begin to answer these important questions. This panel has brought together peace activists in Canada and the USA to share and discuss one of our time's most his critical historical crises. Since Russia's special military operation began in Ukraine on February 24th, we have been bombarded by mainstream media, giving us a distorted and perplexing picture of the crisis. The hysterical demonization of Russia, the Trudeau government's heavy political and military support of the Ukrainian government, and the mainstream media's dishonest reporting have generated an unprecedented hype and confusion in Canada, the USA, and worldwide. So we're here today to ask and to answer, how is it possible and is it possible to get an accurate picture of the Ukraine crisis? And have a really uh, excellent panelist of speakers from both Canada and the United States. I am your moderator for today's webinar. My name is Alison Bodine. I am a social justice activist, author, and researcher here in Vancouver, Canada. I am chair of Vancouver's anti-war coalition, mobilization against war and occupation, MAWO, and I'm on the editorial board of the Fire This Time newspaper. I'm calling in today from Vancouver, the traditional and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil nations. And I ask everyone on the call today to also reflect upon the nations uh, that they are speaking, organizing, and working for justice on their territories. For questions today, we're gonna ask that people please don't use the chat. Please use the Q&A function, which should be near the middle of your screen, whether you're on a computer or on a phone. In the Q&A, you'll be able to type your questions and we'll be able to make sure they're part of the discussion later on after the panel. Also wanna give a big thank you to our sponsors for tonight. Our media sponsor, The Canada Files, and the co-sponsoring organizations, the United National Anti-War Coalition, UNAC, the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War, the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, the Orinoco Tribune, the International Manifesto Group, Mobilization Against War and Occupation, MAWO, the Regina Peace Council, and the International Action Center. And I see members and organizers and supporters of all of these groups online here today. 
But once again, thank you for joining. The Facebook live stream will be going into the chat in this minute. If you can please share it with your uh, friends, your co-fighters, your social media networks. And uh, I'll ask once again, please put your questions in, uh, in the Q&A box for our panel. And if you have any comments, please make sure that they are respectful and on topic. Um, and we will have a really uh, great and important discussion here tonight. Our first speaker for today is Danny Haifong. Danny is a contributor to the Black Agenda Report and co-editor of Friends of Socialist China. He is the host of the YouTube program, The Left Lens. Danny manages his work on Substack and Patreon and can be found on Twitter at Spirit of Ho, which we will put in the chat. The floor is yours, Danny. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who has put this on and who made this event possible. Just want to begin to, by saying that we must be clear, Russia is not our enemy. But polls indicate at this moment that about 70% of Americans view Russia as the enemy. Majorities support a no-fly zone over Ukraine, a policy that would no doubt spark World War III. Of course, when social media corporations are willing to allow posts urging violence against Russia and censor all outlets that provide the Russian viewpoint, it is safe to say that much of the U.S. population could not possibly understand the perils associated with the no-fly zone. A wave of Russophobia has swept over the West to create a suffocating Cold War atmosphere amid Russia's ongoing military operation in Ukraine. But to understand the military operation, Russia's perspective must be taken seriously. This is an unpopular undertaking in the West, since it is far easier to demonize Vladimir Putin and Russia than it is to confront the complicity of your own imperialist government. The fact is that this war did not begin when Russia declared Lugansk and Donetsk independence in late February, nor did it begin when Russia launched its operation shortly thereafter. The war began in October of 1917, when Russia embarked on the path of socialism. The Bolshevik Revolution paved a path of peace in Russia during the First World War. And for this, so-called Western allies invaded the Soviet Union on the side of the defeated counter-revolutionary white army in 1918. The invasion included the deployment of at least 13,000 American troops. Western military support for the counter-revolutionaries prolonged a civil war that would take seven to 12 million lives in the Soviet Union. Just decades later, the Soviet Union would face another invasion from fascist Germany this time, which took the lives of 27 million more. NATO was formed in 1949, four years later, with the purpose of containing the Soviet Union in the name of defending freedom and democracy in Europe. In other words, NATO has always been an instrument of the Cold War. NATO joined major Western institutions in recruiting Nazis after World War II into high-ranking positions to bolster the Cold War effort. Adolf Hausinger, for example, was Adolf Hitler's former chief of staff and served as third in command of the Nazi military. In 1961, he began a three-year stint as chairman of NATO's military committee. Nazi General Hans Speidel served as the supreme commander of NATO's ground forces in Central Europe from 1957 to 1963. NATO thus collaborated with the very fascist forces that took part in one of the most brutal invasions in world history, and it happened right in Russia. The collapse of the Soviet Union four and a half decades later ushered in an economic and political dark age for Russia and unleashed the full wrath of U.S. and NATO-led imperialism. One of the few concessions made to the former Soviet Union was a promise not to expand NATO another inch eastward of Germany. This promise has been broken 14 times since 1997. NATO has expanded into Eastern Europe and former Soviet bloc states all the way up to Russia's border and waged brutal wars of aggression around the world, including in the former Yugoslavia, Afghanistan, and Libya. This history alone exposes the dishonesty of those who claim that Russia has no reason to feel threatened by NATO. 
Over the past 25 years, Russia has made explicitly clear that NATO's expansion is a threat to its existence and would be treated as such. So too have U.S. officials, such as U.S. Ambassador to Russia and our former U.S. Ambassador to Russia and current CIA Director William Burns. Still, NATO has not just expanded, but has also held dozens of military exercises that directly provoke Russia. This includes massive drills in Estonia in 2016, the deployment of thousands of U.S. troops to Poland in 2017, in the performance of war game simulations against a quote-unquote Russian attack in Norway in 2018. Ukraine has always been Russia's red line, and the U.S.-NATO alliance has repeatedly crossed it. In 2008, the U.S. announced its intention to admit Georgia and Ukraine into NATO. In 2014, the U.S. financed and supported far-right and Nazi forces in Ukraine to overthrow the democratically elected government of Viktor Yanukovych. In the aftermath of this violent coup, Ukraine's military apparatus integrated Nazi organizations such as the Azov Battalion into its ranks and gained access to billions in NATO weaponry. Canadian and U.S. military officers have aided those forces for combat. Ukraine's military has made use of this special relationship with the imperialists to wage a brutal assault on eastern Ukraine, which has killed upwards of 10,000 Russian-speaking people in the Donbass region. Donbass is located along the Russia-Ukraine border. Despite the obvious threat of Ukraine's constant violation of the Minsk II ceasefire agreement in 2015 to Russia's security, the Russian Federation waited years before direct it, directly intervening. In the months prior, to fe the February 24th intervention, Russia proposed a list of eight demands to the US, NATO, and Ukraine, which essentially called for the demilitarization of the country and the guarantee that Ukraine would not be admitted into NATO, as well as the use of UN the UN's multilateral institutions to resolve all conflict. These demands were met with total rejection, thereby eliminating any possibility of diplomacy between the two parties. Russia calculated that force was the only option left on the table. Now, this doesn't mean that Russia isn't violating international law that is currently constituted or causing real damage to Ukraine society. Indeed, an operation of this kind is meant to place pressure on Ukraine's government to take Russia's interests seriously. However, at this point, the U.S.-NATO alliance has responded only by pumping even more military weaponry into Ukraine while imposing starvation sanctions on Russia. This has led Russia to scale up its demands to include a change in Ukraine's constitution to enshrine neutrality and recognize not just Donetsk and Lugansk as independent states, but also Crimea as Russian territory. The message is clear. Russia will not end this war without being treated as an equal by those who provoked the crisis. No number of sanctions or military escalations can force Russia to concede on its demands. Russia believes that international law is simply not applicable when the U.S.-NATO alliance and its imperialist allies have spent the last half century trampling on it whenever they see fit. The imperialists see themselves as international law and Russia's very existence as nothing but a nuisance that must be contained and gotten rid of. Russia's perspective is therefore not as detached from reality as Western observers suggest. Russia has been invaded numerous times in the last century and is now being actively threatened by imperialist forces deeply connected to this history. The goal of US-NATO imperialism remains the further dismemberment and overthrow of the Russian Federation. Ukraine is nothing but a chip in this process. A multipolar world is in birth and growing faster than the US and its imperialist allies expected. Russia has reliable friends, including a rising and stable socialist China that can help soften the blow of sanctions. Russia also has the capacity to restructure its economy in ways that prevent total collapse, even if hardship from US and EU sanctions is guaranteed. Arrogant imperialists, who drool over the prospect of Russia falling beneath the weight of the mighty USA are not just mistaken, 
but are also likely in for a rude awakening. Imperialist aggression against Russia threatens global stability and is already sending shockwaves throughout the world capitalist economy in the form of price hikes. Russia's perspective teaches us the most important lesson of all, that peace and stability worldwide is impossible unless the root of endless war is extinguished. That means only the eradication of NATO can open up the necessary breathing room for a political environment to emerge where Russia and Ukraine can independently resolve conflicts free of foreign interference. I appreciate all the work that was done to make this webinar happen and I look forward to the rest of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Danny Haifong, uh, for starting us off today. It's always a difficult job to be the first and appreciate uh, you joining uh, from the United States uh, with that perspective, um, especially focusing on uh, what we're here to discuss tonight as well, which is that this uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis is not taking place in a vacuum. There are important historical events that have taken place before um, that really have shaped what's happening today. And that was a great summary. Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Arnold August. Arnold is a Montreal-based author. He's published three books on US, Cuba, Latin America. As a journalist, his articles appear in English, French, and Spanish in North and South America, Europe, and the Middle East. He was awarded a journalism award from the Cuban Union of Journalists. He's a contributing editor for the Canada Files, member of the International Manifesto, Festo group, regularly to Telesor TV, Cuban TV, and Press TV. I also wanted to mention that Arnold will be speaking in both English and French. So if you have not yet joined the English channel, but you want to listen in English, please do so uh, now. Arnold, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Hi, Arnold. Sorry, you've muted yourself. You were on. Can I start all over again? Sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> no, I have to start all over again. Sorry. There is the hope of another round of Russian-Ukraine negotiations these days, something that we all wish comes to fruition. However, Canadian media and Ottawa are in lockstep with United States media and Washington at what, in what seems to be an attempt to sabotage a peaceful solution. Why do I assert that? Joseph Borrell, who is the European Union former foreign policy head, said on March 11, and I quote, the West made a mistake in promising Ukraine NATO NATO membership, end of quote. This, this European statement could be a game changer. Why? It constitutes an inadvertent admission that the fault of the crisis lies with NATO and not Russia, and thus could potentially propel a negotiated peaceful settlement, which we all want. However, a close investigation reveals that there is nothing on Joseph Borrell's statement in Canadian or US mainstream media, nor from Washington or Ottawa, a blackout. Thus, US, Canada, NATO even censures one of their own, in this case, Borrell. And therefore, this constitutes yet another proof that NATO is the aggressor who would only accept peace with Russia until now, if it were on the basis of their own conditions, that would be unacceptable to Moscow. The March 9th bombing of a maternity and children's hospital is being blamed on Russia. But what are the facts? In late February, numerous non-Russian alternative sources, as well as Russian platforms indicated that the fascist Azov battalion as part of the U Ukrainian armed forces kicked out the staff and patients 
from that hospital. They were replaced by the armed assault. This constitutes a perfect scenario for a false flag. Whether the March 9th bombing of the hospital is an inside job by Assaf or Russian hunting down fascists, who to believe? Now, false flags are part of what I would call the American DNA. Now, as I very briefly note only some examples of this American DNA in action, please keep in mind, in contrast, the true nature of Russia as just argued by the previous speaker, Danny Haifong. Example, 1889 Cuba, the US main battleship mysteriously blew up in Havana Harbor, the US blaming Spain as a pretext to enter the Cuban Spanish war to, event to eventually colonize Cuba. 1954, Nicaragua, Operation Washtub, CIA planted Soviet arms. 1961, Cuba again, Operation Mongoose, Covert actions to blame Cuba. 1961, Cuba again, Operation Bingo. Incident against US controlled Gitmo to be blamed on Cuba. 1965, Vietnam, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, a US naval vessel attack blaming North Vietnam. 2003, Iraq, weapons of mass destruction to invade Iraq. 2001, Libya. 2013, unfounded claims that Gaddafi was massacring his own people in order to invade Libya. 2013, Syria, the Ghouta sarin gas invention to attack Syria. 2013, Syria again, the Duma chemical false flag to attack Syria. Now, the Canadian mainstream media, including French language state television, is fully compliant with the auto Ottawa, Washington, anti-Russian narrative by going out of its way to amplify false flags. I'll be switching to French now. La Télévision d'État canadien de langue française disposait d'un journalisme international positif dans les années 1950. Par exemple, un journaliste à l'époque, René Lévesque, a été le premier à interviewer Positivement, Fidel Castro en avril 59 lors de sa visite à Montréal. Cependant, la télévision d'État de langue française a ensuite commencé à dégénérer. Il a atteint de nouveaux crus, surtout depuis les attentats terroristes de 11 septembre 2001 aux États-Unis et les guerres américaines d'agression et de destruction qui ont suivi et ont appuyé en grande partie par Ottawa et le Parlement canadien. La crise ukrainienne actuelle a conduit la télévision d'État canadien de langue française encore plus loin sur la route en tant que porte-parole servile d'Ottawa et de Washington. Prenons l'exemple des démissions décrypteur, casseur de code, qui prétend tenir debout et je cite, contre la désinformation, ce qui est vrai et ce qui n'est pas vrai sur les réseaux sociaux. Fin de la citation de Zo. Le reportage principal actuel a été rejoué plusieurs fois la semaine dernière et est toujours diffusé à la télévision ces jours-ci. Malgré le bilan notoire des États-Unis dans la création des faux drapeaux pour justifier l'agression, l'émission défend la position américano-canadienne sur le bombardement de l'hôpital pour enfants de 9 mars. Et cela, il faut souligner, même après que le bombardement s'est avéré être encore un autre faux drapeau américain. Qu'est-ce qui vraiment, qu est s'est que vraiment passé? Tous les rapports plausibles montrent que fin de février, le bataillon ukrainien fasciste Aznov a fait éruption dans l'hôpital, a dispersé tout le personnel et les patients et y a installé ses armes. Ce fut l'origine du, du bombardement. Zelensky, bien sûr, alors qu'il génocide russe comme c'est bien pratique, 
n'est-ce pas? Les reportages les fondus par les décrypteurs seraient plus plausibles s'il avait également décodé d'autres enjeux en fonction de ce qu'il prétend faire, et je cite encore, s'opposer à la désinformation, ce qui est vrai et ce qui n'est pas vrai dans les réseaux sociaux. Fin de la citation. Par exemple, qu'en est-il de la récente fermeture systématique par les États-Unis des médias sociaux alternatifs tels que Russia Today et des chaînes YouTube progressistes? Décrypteur, décrypteur, quelque chose à dire là-dessus? Les journalistes et décrypteurs ont-ils quelque chose à dire sur la fermeture par les réseaux sociaux américains du compte Twitter de US, ASB Military? C'est l'une des seules plateformes qui fournit des informations précises sur le terrain en Ukraine. Par exemple, il propose des vidéos filmées de l'Ukraine sur la façon dont les Ukrainiens implorent l'armée ukrainienne et les paramilitaires fascistes de sortir de leur quartier au lieu de les utiliser comme bouclier humain. On n'entend jamais parler de ça, n'est-ce pas? Cependant, des crypteurs de la télévision publique canadienne, de la langue française, n'est que la partie émergée de l'iceberg. Par exemple, alors que les Canadiens espèrent la paix, la télévision de langue française de Radio-Canada TV from Radio-Canada is embedded with Canadian military uh, volunteers in the battle for Ukraine. And it is said that there are approximately 1,000 Canadian military volunteers. Our journalist proudly reports how these military personnel left Canada to fight. They make sure that Ukrainians have weapons and body armor. And they are training Ukrainians that they have their own places to do that, as we've seen. That's it. Was there a technical problem at the end? No. No, we're good. You can keep going. No, I just finished. Okay. I just finished by saying, uh, well, you know, you, I gave you a, a, a short rundown, uh, you know, on, on the issue of false flags. I prepared this a couple of days ago, but uh, since then, the uh, uh, the disinformation regarding regarding that hospital has gone full steam. The more that it's been. Uh, Uh, discover that it is a false flag, the more they insist that it is uh, that it do, did take place, that it was a fault of Russia, and using this as a pretext not only to further their aggressive policy against Russia, but to sabotage the attempt to uh, go for a peaceful solution, which is also always possible if both sides really want it. Thank you. Thank you, Arnold, and uh, no worries about extending to answer that important question and give some more information. Um, I, it's elicited a, a lot of comments in the chat, so I, I know some of that will come up in our discussion as well um, as we go to the Q&A. Um, and so thank you very much for that introduction and for uh, sharing the images also. Next, we have uh, Sarah Flounders, another speaker calling in from the United States. Sarah is a co-director of the International Action Center in New York City and a contributing editor of Workers' World. She has edited two books, NATO in the Balkans and Hidden Agenda, the U.S.-NATO takeover of Yugoslavia. Sarah, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Allison and the organizers of tonight's meeting. It's really an honor to participate tonight. We face a big challenge on how to mobilize against the most dangerous imperialist war of our time, a war that could and certainly seems will expand even more dangerously. It's already a world war. It's already involves every country. Every country is being threatened by the US, ordered to comply. 
every country is forced to decide if they will comply with the sanctions war on Russia. Its impact stretches far beyond the military battlefield in Ukraine. But I want to focus most of my discussion tonight on the kinds of clear and unifying demands that I think can help our movement. We're activists, we're fighters, we're in the streets. So I propose US NATO out of Ukraine and stop US NATO war on Russia and end the sanctions war. And I'd also add, if you care about Ukraine, stop NATO. We can't for a minute let imperialism act as if they're defending Ukraine. They are using Ukraine, using Ukraine as a pawn in a war against Russia and the EU for supremacy, for domination. This war did not start on February 24th with Russian intervention. It's been raging for the past eight years, at least, and of course, further, further. This war was launched by the US, this stage of it, with the fascist coup in Kiev in 2014. And the war could end today, today, if the Pentagon stopped pumping billions of dollars of lethal weapons, US advisors, military contractors, thousands of mercenary volunteers into the Ukraine. This war could end if the US stopped shelling the Russian border. Let's focus the attention of every worker that we can reach on the US role in instigating and provoking this present war in Ukraine. Now, also, I think we should be clear, we're not debating whether or if NATO should expand to include the membership of Ukraine at some future date. Frankly, it's already happened. US NATO strategists, US AID funded programs, CIA forces, military advisors, funding for fascist forces are in the Ukraine now and have been since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Washington has openly put nuclear capable missiles in the Ukraine and in Eastern Europe along the Russian border surrounding Russia with military maneuvers. US advisors and US trained Ukrainian forces have been firing on the borders of Russia for eight years since the elected coup overthrew, since the US backed coup overthrew the elected government in Ukraine. In the Donbass, the small people's republics of Donetsk and Lugansk really heroically resisting all these years. It's, it's the US organized and funded war that's killed 14,000 people. Now, Biden brags, even in his State of the Union address, how many thousands of additional missiles he's sending to Ukraine. More each day. The numbers, the types of weapons keep increasing. NATO membership has become irrelevant in US war planning. Let's consider the US commanded NATO military forces have been massively involved in wars in Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Libya. None of these countries were NATO members. Ukrainian troops were sent to take part in these criminal wars under US NATO command, even when not a member of NATO. Ukraine hosted joint military training exercises with US, British, and Canadian troops. So Ukraine is a de facto member of NATO. I also think we should try hard to not include the slogans that are an echo chamber of US propaganda. When we include, and especially lead with, the demand Russian troops out, this just reinforces the corporate media saturation and whatever is added further down in text or even slogans is just lost. We need to make demands on our own government in Canada and certainly in the US. So US NATO out of Ukraine. The 40 million people of Ukraine are being used by imperialism. So this, that's why I raised the slogan, if you care about Ukraine, disband NATO or NATO out. 
since long before the February 24th Russian intervention, since the 2014 US-backed fascist coup, Ukraine was reduced to the poorest country in Europe with the highest rate of migration. The IMF restructured the economy, demanded austerity measures, it gutted the pensions, cut social spending. The mass privatizations of socially owned property brought economic ruin. The human trafficking is the most serious in Europe, in the Ukraine, with commercial sexual exploitation, forced labor, and the buying of children from orphanages. This is the cost of the US restructuring of Ukraine. The largest surrogacy pregnancy industry in the world, $15,000 a baby, that's in Ukraine today. And Ukraine, although flooded with NATO weapons, is so lacking in the most basic social services that it has the lowest rate of vaccinations in Europe. Only one in five Ukrainians have received a full course of the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, vaccine. The vaccination rate for polio, measles, diphtheria is also the lowest in Europe. In the crowded refugee conditions in surrounding European countries, they are fearful of new COVID variants because of this very fact. So there's a military war more dangerous by the day, increasing for eight years, and there's an economic war, as President Biden says, intended to create great pain. The extreme economic sanctions imposed on Russia are dragging the whole world into a war. And there's a seismic shift. It's sending shockwaves through the global economy. The well-established capitalist disorder dominated by US imperialism and in place since World War II is now on very shaky ground. A big calculation is which countries will go along with the economic war on Russia imposed by the US. This economic warfare is damaging to their own interests, their own economic interests. They don't wanna go along. Countries re representing a majority of world population are no longer willing to tie their sovereignty to total Wall Street control. The war to stop the growing integration of the Eurasian bloc of countries stretching from China, South Asia, through Central Asia, and Russia to Europe is a huge economic advantage to all the countries involved. How, that's what the US wants to break. However, the growing integration in, U, in, in EU trade and investment with Russia and China threatens the domination of US corporate power in Europe and threatens US global hegemony. The EU is the biggest investor in, in Russia. And there's a rivalry of the sinking US dollar and Euro currency. It's a big part of this war. So the sanctions are war. That's important to say again and again, they're not a deterrent to war. They're not a substitute for war. They are in fact an escalation of war. To maintain the dominant position of US imperialism, that's, that's only one tool they see to enable them to do this. And it's war, both military war and economic war of sanctions. More than 40 countries today that involve a third of the world population already suffer from the economic measures that Washington has imposed. The sanctions on Cuba, on China, Venezuela, Iran, Palestine, Syria, Ethiopia, Zimbabwe, and many others. A third of the world population already under sanctions. Now, many of these countries are finding ways to survive through complex barter and exchange programs that are developing as the number of sanctioned countries grows. Many other current countries that aren't under US sanctions are now refusing to comply. And they're all being put under intense pressure. But think of it, India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Indonesia, South Africa, Kenya, Tan Tanzania, Turkey, United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Brazil, Argentina, Bolivia, Mexico, 
and other countries have already refused to comply with US measures that damage their own trade relations. This is a new day. It's a shocking, it's a big change. It's why I say it's a world war and a real confrontation. These are growing economies with large populations. So it's a global struggle. And in closing, I'll just say, um, it's not the only war going on. And we need to say that again and again. Let's always raise the US-backed war in Yemen, the US war on Syria, never forget Palestine, the calculated starvation of Afghanistan, the threats on Iran, along with the attempt to starve a third of the world's population through sanctions. It's also no, it's not the largest war since World War II. Let's remember the US NATO bombing of Yugoslavia for 70 days, this, the destruction of 430 schools, 33 hospitals, and 14 tanks. The US targeted the food and the fertilizer and the water and the fuel storage of the entire civilian population. And in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Libya, in Syria, they've targeted the civilians and left the country in ruins. So we call for US NATO out of Ukraine, disband the NATO war machine. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah Flounders, uh, for also ending with some uh, demands, which I know we'll discuss more tonight. What should be the demands of the anti-war movement of peace-loving people around the world? It's very helpful. Also for bringing in the issue of sanctions, which is uh, critical when we talk about uh, the machinery of the United States and imperialists when it comes to sanction regimes imposed on, like you said, a third of the world. Our next speaker is Ken Stone. So we're moving back uh, to the other side of the border. Uh, Ken Stone is a longtime anti-war, labor, anti-racism, and environmental activist. He is treasurer of the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War, and an executive member of the Syria Solidarity Movement. Ken, the floor is yours. Hi Ken, sorry, you're on mute. So. How's that? That's great. Thank you. Tomorrow, Ukrainian Pre President Zelensky will address the Canadian Parliament to condemn the Russian military operation in his country and to ask for even more funding and lethal weapons from Canada. He will probably also request even more coercive economic measures against Russia. Canadian MPs of all parties will probably follow the example of their UK counterparts and instead of advising him to de-escalate the rhetoric and negotiate an end to the conflict, will give Zelensky a standing ovation and accede to his request for more aid for Ukraine and more sanctions on Russia, which will actually prolong the conflict, create more refugees, cause the deaths of more Ukrainian civilians and the destruction of more Ukrainian civilian infrastructure. What is wrong with this picture? What's wrong is hypocrisy. The struggle for Ukraine did not start on February 24th, 2022. While Trudeau and leaders of the other four parties will condemn the Russian intervention, none of them will acknowledge that Canada has been illegally interfering in the internal affairs of Ukraine for over 100 years. In mid-1918, acceding to pressure from the British Empire, the Canadian government of Robert Borden dispatched almost 6,000 Canadian soldiers to join various white army units in order to try and put down the Bolshevik Revolution and to restore capitalism to Russia. According to the Canadian Encyclopedia, some of these units saw action on the ground and in the skies over Ukraine. Uh, photo one, if you please, Allison. Here's a photo of Canadian conscripts for the Canadian Siberian Expeditionary Force who attended en masse a meeting of the Victoria Trades and Labour Council 
on December 13, 1918 in Victoria, British Columbia. The trade unions entitled the meeting Hands Off Russia, and they tried to get the conscripts to mutiny, which some of them actually did. Following World War II, Canada switched from being a willing accomplice of the British Empire to a willing accomplice of the US Empire. In order to overthrow the post-war Soviet Union and to cement control over Western Europe, Canadian External Affairs Minister Lester Pearson promoted the idea of a US-led Western military alliance, which we now know as NATO. Pearson was an anti-communist ideologue who was terrified that the working classes on the continent of Europe, which had participated in the anti-Nazi wartime resistance, often under communist leadership, saw socialism as the wave of the future and might erupt into revolution themselves. In order to forestall such an outbreak in Canada, the Mackenzie King Liberal government in which Pearson served as Deputy Minister of External Affairs admitted tens of thousands of Ukrainian wartime Nazi collaborators and sympathizers to Canada as citizens. In 1955, the Saint Laurent Liberal government in which Pearson served as the Minister of External Affairs used federal funding to establish the Ukrainian Canadian Congress, UCC, in order to create a constituency in Canada for rapidly anti-communist and anti-Soviet policies. It did the same thing among other Eastern European emigre groups in Canada. These groups in turn were used as soft power weapons, speaking openly about sabotaging and overthrowing the Soviet republics of Eastern Europe, such as Ukraine and other Warsaw Pact countries. Uh, photo two, please, uh, Allison. Here is a chilling photo of Lester Pearson speaking to a gathering of Canadian Ukrainian youth standing in formation in Nazi style uniforms on Parliament Hill in, uh, I think it was June 1967. Following the demise of the Soviet Union, when NATO should have dissolved itself but didn't, successive Canadian governments participated in NATO's relentless eastward expansion, despite the pledge given to Mr. Gorbachev following the US-inspired coup in Ukraine in 2014, Victoria Newland revealed that the US had spent $5 billion and 15 years hatching the coup. But few Canadians know that during the very same period, Canadian government spent nearly $1 billion Canadian organizing the Orange Revolution in Ukraine in 2004, as well as the Maidan coup of 2014. The purpose of these illegal interventions in Ukraine's internal affairs was to create a de facto NATO state in Ukraine and to expand NATO right up to the borders of Russia, at which point Russia, like the former Yugoslavia, would be dismembered. Neo-Nazis gained several key positions in the junta's cabinet and security apparatus, but that did not stop the newly elected Trudeau government from supporting the Ukrainian junta. Even the Nazi-led massacre at the Odessa Trade Union Building and the Kiev regime's attack on the autonomy and language rights of Russophones in the Donbass, which led to war, didn't dampen Trudeau's affinity for the junta. This support has a lot to do with Christia Freeland. She was Trudeau's foreign minister starting in 2017. Freeland's grandfather was Michael Chomiak, a very highly placed Nazi collaborator from Ukraine who was installed as editor of an influential newspaper in Nazi occupied Poland. One can't choose one's grandparents. However, Freeland has only always made positive comments about her grandfather. And when publicly confronted about the truth about her maternal grandfather's Nazi past, she refused to disavow Chomiak and instead called it Russian disinformation. As global affairs minister, she used her influence to favor Ukraine with at least $600 million of funding. The placement of over 200 uh, Canadian trainers 
with the Ukrainian military as part of Operation Unifier, plus Canadian special forces, various kinds of armaments, and the support of Canadian warships in the Black Sea. Interestingly, mainstream media reports in Canada have demonstrated that Canadian trainers trained Ukraine's neo-Nazi Azov Battalion, which was recently incorporated into Ukraine's regular army. May I have photo three, uh, Allison? Here is a self-tweeted photo of Christia Freeland at a recent demonstration organized by the UCC in Toronto in support of the Ukrainian government. In it, she is holding a scarf in the colors and shape of the flag of Stefan Bandera's pro-Nazi party in the Ukraine in World War II. She later deleted the tweet. Canadian support for Ukraine's undemocratic coup government was only the latest chapter in Canada's violation of Ukrainian sovereignty, in effect, turning Ukraine into the tip of a spear to prod the Russian bear. Those who watch Zelensky's parliamentary address tomorrow will be seeing the peace candidate of the 2019 Ukrainian election, who promised to use the Minsk protocols to bring an end to the war on the Donbass and to restore good relations between Ukraine and Russia. He accomplished neither in the past three years. Instead, under his leadership, the war intensified against the breakaway republics with a death toll of nearly 15,000, mostly on the Donbass side, and nearly a million refugees, again, mostly on the Donbass side. In my opinion, military, by, military action by Russia on February 24 was A, a response to the US and NATO rejection of draft treaties submitted by Russia late last year, B, an escalation of Kiev's war on the Donbass, and C, a public declaration by Zelensky that he wanted Ukraine to join NATO. It's, always, it's also a response to a century of well-funded and malicious meddling in the internal affairs of Ukraine by the West, including Canada. I think it's extraordinarily dishonest to treat February 24th as the beginning of a conflict between Russia and Ukraine. Rather, February 24th, February 24th, Russian special military operation was the inevitable result of a response of Russia to decades of US and NATO threats to the security of the Russian Federation. It's always regrettable when civilians are killed and maimed and infrastructure is destroyed. But the cause of the suffering were decisions that were taken over the course of decades by the US and NATO. In fact, it's hard to see any other possible outcome of the unlawful and relentless eastward expansion of NATO, the 2014 coup in Kiev and its war on the Donbass, other than military conflict over Ukraine. Tomorrow, we'll witness a huge outpouring of selective empathy in Ottawa for Ukraine. I say selective because the leaders of the countries targeted by Canada, such as President Milosevic of Yugoslavia, Colonel Gaddafi of Libya, and President Jean-Bertrand Aristide of Haiti, never got to address the assembled parliament of Canada. There will be huge crocodile tears for the suffering of the people of Ukraine. But nobody on Parliament Hill will advise Zelensky to do the right thing, de-escalate the rhetoric, and seek a negotiated end to the conflict. To my mind, however, the ultimate responsibility for the suffering of the people of Ukraine lies squarely in the bloody hands of the Canadian, US, and NATO governments, and not Russia. Thank you. Thank you to Ken Stone from the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War, uh, especially for bringing in all of the important information about Canada's complicity and implication in this uh, US or this uh, Russia Ukraine uh, crisis and really what we must focus on as the anti war movement here in Canada. Our next uh, speaker is the, the last speaker of our panel here tonight before we move into the question and answers. So again, I encourage people, please post your questions in the Q&A box at the, which you can find in the bottom of your screen and not in the chat. 
uh, and then we'll uh, be able to start our discussion promptly after our last speaker. Ali Yaravani is the political editor of the Fire This Time newspaper and Battle of Ideas Press in Canada. He is Turkish Tartar from Iran, and he was a participant in the 1979 Iranian Revolution as a revolutionary socialist organizer. In 1984, he exited Iran for Europe, and he has since been organizing for social justice causes in Europe, the US, and Canada. In the US, he was active in the immigrant rights movement and the unionization of undocumented immigrant workers. Ali worked as an undocumented worker in the garment sweatshops as a single and double needle sewing machine operator in Los Angeles, starting at $10 a day. In Canada for 10 years, he was a delegate of QP15 to the Vancouver and District Labour Council. He has been a founder of Mobilization Against War and Occupation, MAWO, Vancouver Communities in Solidarity with Cuba, the Palestine Solidarity Group, and co-founder of the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, to name a few. Ali, the floor is yours. And you are on mute. Looks like you're good. Oh, you, uh, you, uh, you can hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay. Great. Yep. Uh, and thank you, um, Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War for organizing and also the sponsors uh, for this uh, webinar. And uh, thank you. Uh, everyone who attended tonight in uh, this webinar to discuss very important matter for working people uh, around the world and discuss and also uh, hopefully to debate. I have uh, a rough uh, outline of uh, uh, what I'm going to write an article. And uh, basically uh, what I'm doing uh, with this is uh, uh, trying to responding to imperialist propaganda and, uh, and misconceptions. Uh, imperialist propaganda from the, from the right and some of the misconceptions uh, from the left and uh, also the general in uh, uh, overall public discussion. <clears throat> I'll try to be very simple and, and to the point and uh, to uh, present to you something for critical thinking and uh, challenging uh, ourselves of understanding the situation today in Ukraine uh, uh, and uh, the related to the, the class struggle around the world. The, basically, uh, if I break down uh, the, my talk right now is, is addressing the lies about the unprovoked, saying that the, uh, Russia military operation and military inter intervention in, uh, in Ukraine was unprovoked. And uh, also to address the US, NATO, EU, that they are really helping uh, Ukraine in the war with Russia or generally helping. Uh, in this uh, very dire situation, uh, Ukraine. Uh, the third one is uh, the manipulation and the spinning of Ukraine uh, the, the, through uh, bringing uh, the issue of sovereignty and self-determination uh, to confuse masses and to uh, the, uh, and to win over the uh, the war against Russia. and lies about uh, that Russia destroying a democratic and peaceful Ukraine. 
The next uh, one is that lies about the insignificance of fascist and Nazi armed groups and organizations in uh, Ukraine. Uh, and Canada role in 2014 and, and before that, and, uh, and uh, the role of Nazi armed group of, and organizations that can uh, uh, actually explain very well. And thank you, Ken, make my uh, job easy, my task easy. And uh, the building, uh, the last point I will present to you is building an anti-war, anti-capitalist movement. So today we are the 19 days, 19 days um, of Russian military intervention in Ukraine. <clears throat> the, these 19 days have brought tremendous destruction and misery for the Ukrainian people. And hundreds of people and soldiers on both sides have been killed. We are witnessing a sad, and tragic moment in the history of humankind. <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> this war and crisis have challenged us to defend humanity and take a clear working class position that can help us to advance our struggle against capitalism and imperialism. Why, it is, why is it important not just to use our ideology and principle to examine every word, every word even, but also as one of the great revolutionaries Lenin, Lenin said that in this concrete situation that is in front of us, we think about a concrete analysis of a concrete situation rather than just talk about an abstract uh, principles and, 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 and abstract uh, notions. In my opinion, it, it does not matter it does not matter what president, uh, uh, what president uh, Putin sa says or believes about the Russia-Ukraine historic connection or neo-Nazi group uh, activities in Ukraine. Not to say it's not important. I'm just saying in the final analysis, this is not the reason that we pay attention to a tragedy, to a crisis uh, in front of us. <clears throat> We are, this war and crisis have challenged us to defend humanity and take a clear working class position uh, that, as I said, that can uh, uh, advance our struggle. My starting point is to look at the Ukraine crisis, not by its own dynamics uh, on the ground, but through class struggle worldwide within the unfolding Cold War II or the new Cold War. This will enable us to understand what position and action revolutionary socialists must take to put the working class everywhere, particularly in Europe, in Russia and in uh, Ukraine in a better position to fight against capitalism imperialism and the domination of US NATO around the world. Cold War II results from the same contradictions as the first Cold War. Economic competition, struggles over market shares and shaping sphere of political and geographical influence. However, the big difference is that the first Cold War was capitalism, the way that it's, it was structured, 
was capitalism versus communism. Interestingly, the new Cold War or Cold War II is capitalism versus capitalism, since Russia and China are both using private property competition and the capitalist market domestically and worldwide. Russia is a capitalist state and China practices market socialism. So the Russia-Ukraine crisis must be seen within this new system. It also means Cold War II will be deadlier and bloodier conflict because in the old Cold War, there was some kind of balance and agreement under the called the Tant or peaceful existence between the US and Soviet Union which made avoiding direct conflict easier. At the same time, there, at the current time today, there is no agreement and balance between new multiple ec economic and political powers in the world. <clears throat> Russia's military intervention in Ukraine has brought what everyone was taking was talking about to the surface and broke and broke the unstable status quo we, we have been observing since 1999. On March 24, Cold War II became official. Without this context, the Cold War II, it is impossible to understand. Ukraine's capitulation to imperialist, imperialist powers and Russia's move to take over Ukraine as a, as a needed action to secure its existence. Within this context, we need to realize that whatever working people are listening to, reading, watching, sensing, and feeling at this time, it is based on manipulation and deception by the US, NATO, and EU with extreme sens sensationalization, dramatization, and romanticization of, the, of the, this tra very tragic situation in Ukraine. Most of you might probably know that, that usually people say that when there is a war, two sides of the war are working people who are going to fight and kill each other. That's exactly the purpose of this manipulation and deception is. Okay, I have three minutes left. Yes, <clears throat> the whole script being brought, the whole script being broadcasted by mainstream media is written by the US State Department. Since 2001, the US and its imperialist allies, including Canada, have waged war and occupation against more than two dozen, dozen countries around the world basically colonial and semi-colonial country. Have, <clears throat> and this, including Afghanistan, and to name a few, Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Sudan, Somalia, Mali, Syria, and Yemen. They killed only from 2001 until now, more than one and a half million people. And all this, manipulation and deception around, uh, um, around Ukraine, you can compare with what has happened since 2001 in, in more than 21 years. <clears throat> they bombed everything for more than 21 years. They bombed infrastructures, such as hospitals, schools, kindergarten, 
power plants, weddings, funeral, marketplaces, basically everything they could turn to rubble. The same day that Russia mili Russia's military intervention started in Ukraine, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen were all heavily bombed by, by the US, Israel, Saudi Arabia. Where is the outcry? Where is the new the news coverage? All the news says is that bad guy is Russia and the good guy are the good guys are UK and uh, Ukraine and NATO. The people who argued Russia had many options not to choose war are missing a few essential points. All aspects of negotiation got blocked and locked. They were basically exhausted with no possible meeting on site. Despite President Putin's and Russia's insistence for continuing negotiations. The severity of the war in Donbas, Luhansk and Donetsk, continued by the Ukrainian government and pro-Nazi groups. And this war didn't start as previous uh, speakers said, uh, uh, explained in uh, just in uh, March 24. It truly started from 2014 with the, with the coup against uh, the Yanukovych elected president elected of uh, Ukraine. <clears throat> US, US NATO completely turning Ukraine into a de facto, de facto NATO. Me NATO member with just one and a half billion dollars worth of military machinery, equipments and training just in last six months, which Canada also has played an important role in this. President Zelensky dismissed Russia's request to dismantle neo-Nazi groups, including the Azov Battalion, while these fascist and Nazi groups, groupings, gain influence and, and more presence in army and security forces. So what would be the alternative? Considering the refusal to engage in in on-site negotiation and dialogue, and the fact that Minsk II agreement was effectively dead, there was no way to continue the status quo, which basically means the continuation of civil war and further integration of Ukraine, Ukraine in NATO, and the further encirclement of Russia. With this status quo, the US and imperialist allies are pushing for the complete Containment. Oh, okay. I have to wrap up. Pushing for the complete containment of Russia and its subordination to US NATO imperialist order, resulting in Russia losing its sovereignty like other former East European socialist law countries. I have to. Uh, shortened. Uh, thank you for your patience, everyone. So <clears throat> more on, on uh, the on the role of Russia in Ukraine and also uh, more on uh, US NATO uh, involvement in, uh, uh, in Ukraine. Uh, we can discuss it uh, through q and I apologize that uh, I did not completely um, calculate the time, 
but I like just to finish it with uh, uh, with what we what what we needed today in order to uh, uh, to intervene and 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 to uh, bring all this uh, 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 crisis and conflict to to peace. We are we are, we are for peace in Ukraine, as as Sarah said. Uh, if U.S. stop meddling in in that area in Ukraine, specifically, war will stop immediately. We are for ceasefire and negotiation toward a peaceful outcome for both countries, based on seeking a win-win uh, result. We also want Ukraine to become a military neutral nation. We ask Ukraine to drop membership application to NATO. <clears throat> US all, and then we demand US and uh, NATO troops out of Ukraine. And we are for self-determination for Donbass. And we, we want the Ukraine and Russia to sign a non-aggression treaty and for Ukraine to disarm fascist and Nazi group within the, within the police, the special forces, army, security forces, and national guard. We want Canada hands off Ukraine. We want Canada out of NATO. We say no to severe sanction, unjust, unfair, and illegal sanctions against Russia. We want no war of NATO US against Russia. Building what we need to do basically in order to be able to defend the working class, working people and oppressed people against US aggression and US NATO aggression is working together on the environmental issue as it relates to war and humanity and connecting to the struggle against capitalism. We need to be revolutionary interna internationalists. Nothing that concerns humanity and its suffering is alien to us. We have to respond to this. We need a movement. However, our demand must fit within the concrete situation and unfolding historical context. We need to build a strong and effective anti-war movement to be able to organize hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people against war occupation, sanctions, and, and imperialist domination. Our demands and actions must put the working class everywhere in a better position to fight against capitalism and imperialism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ali Yervani, the political editor of the Fire This Time newspaper. Again, to all of our panel, um, I was just finishing my uh, announcements. We do have some important actions to announce uh, before uh, we end the webinar today and uh, kind of organizing everyone's questions. It's been really great to see all of the questions and feedbacks uh, coming in uh, the channel. I'm now going uh, to ask, we have two uh, people that are kind of come up and ask some questions ahead of time. But as they get themselves prepared, I will mention that today's panel has been organized uh, with some costs, uh, especially the interpretation, and uh, wanted to go ahead and ask people uh, if they could to please donate towards the cost of this webinar by making a donation to the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War. I saw that um, information was posted in the chat earlier about how to donate, but encourage you to donate and uh, please support uh, this panel, but also ongoing work. 
The link is now in the chat and they can also accept e-transfers. Uh, let me know if you have any questions about that. Um, we also have uh, upcoming uh, Days of Action, the Canadian Days of Action on Ukraine, March 19th and 20th. Encourage local cities to get involved and we'll put that in the chat. And then March 26, 22 marks seven years of the brutal war in Yemen. And there is a Canada-wide day of action being called for March 26. So I'll put that information in the chat as well. Um, and I think now uh, our questioners are ready to begin. Uh, so the first is coming from the media sponsor for today's panel, Aidan Jonah of the Canada Files. Aidan, floor is yours. Thank you very much. So uh, yes, as mentioned, I am the Editor-in-Chief of the Canada Files, a socialist anti-imperialist news outlet focusing on investigative coverage of Canadian imperialism. So my question uh, is for Arnold or and or Ken. So what have the, actually Danny, you could also, uh, I'll go on this. Uh, what have the responses of socialist nations such as China and that of Russia's Communist Party been to the launching of Russia's military intervention in Ukraine. Thank you, Aiden, for that question. Who would like to uh, start off with an answer? Arnold, do you wanna go ahead? Yeah, I'll, I'll deal uh, only with China. Perhaps Ken or someone else could deal with, with the Russian Communist Party. The Chinese position, for example, when the uh, vote took place in the United Nations General Assembly, which was uh, promoted by the United States and Ukraine to condemn the Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine, uh, 35 countries abstained, I mean, quite a few countries abstained, including China. I fully understand China's position to abstain because in my view, whether that was their objective or not, it puts them in a very favorable situation as an intermediary to try to uh, put forward a negotiated peace settlement. And in fact, this is happening. Now, China, you know, uh, the United States did not like it. Just yesterday, they started a, uh, a new false flag saying that Russia asked China for military help, which is not at all the case. At the same time, China has said very clearly, even though they abstain, that the ties between China and Russia cannot be broken. They're very strong. In fact, as we speak now, uh, as a result of the sanctions put on by the United States against Russia, Russia and China are working out uh, some further economic uh, deals in order to alleviate the inevitable results of the American sanctions against, uh, against Russia. So I think China is playing a very positive role in this whole, uh, in this whole scenario. Great. Thank you, Arnold. Uh, Danny, go ahead. Sure. I just want to add on to that. I think Arnold did a really good job in summarizing the role. Sorry, Danny, China. you're quiet. Could you maybe move your microphone a oh. bit? Oh, sorry about that. Um, I'll just speak louder because I can't really move it. Um, yeah, I was just saying that Arnold made good points about China and the role of China in this conflict. Uh, China is really navigating pretty complicated waters here, given that Ukraine is an economic partner, but at the same time, the Russia-China strategic partnership is really one of the most critical aspects of global economic political development that's going on right now, this trend toward a multipolar world. So China is fully going to maintain relations with Russia. There's no doubt about that. The Communist Party of the Russian Federation, though, has been really interesting in this regard, in that although the Communist Party of the Russian Federation is very critical of Russia's capitalist economy, very critical of the government, generally has been trying to make waves and actually gain more power within 
the state to enact its own agenda and counter even the United Russia party, Putin's party, uh, in all spheres of society and has been relatively successful in doing so, it has actually taken a relatively supportive orientation towards this intervention. Actually, the Communist Party of the Russian Federation was the party which submitted to parliament the uh, proposal to recognize Donetsk and Lugansk as independent republics. So it was actually them who started the process in parliament to have that done. And they actually just uh, uh, put out a statement today kind of going over what we've been doing today, the historical context of the conflict. And while taking the position that war is not in the interests of the people, they say that actually the Russian government is doing what is in the interest of the people with regard to the intervention. So there is a lot of support for this from the Russian, uh, the Communist Party of the Russian Federation because of, I think, a lot of the things that we talked about here in the sense that there is this context and there is this direct threat to communists themselves. I mean, the Communist Party in Ukraine, communist parties in general are banned. There is this threat of Ukraine if it go, comes into NATO officially, even if it is an unofficial member, if it is able to uh, sort of monopolize on this coup government that has sort of been uh, trying to take over all of Ukraine for the last seven years, then that actually does directly threaten Russia and it directly threatens the Communist Party of the Russian Federation. So there is more of a, I think, positive tone than you would expect, I think, people in the West to take given that the context is a lot different. So I find that actually very fascinating, given that the Communist Party of the Russian Federation is is generally not paid attention to, even among communists in the West. But especially now, there is no attention to what they are saying about this intervention. So they're taking an anti-war position, but at the same time saying that there is a context to this and actually it is correct to do something about this Ukraine situation because of how much of a threat it is to the interests of everybody. Thank you, Danny. Um, I'll just say briefly before Sarah and Ken are both going to address this as well, but a kind of related question that's been coming up is if someone could address the anti-war protests in Russia. Sarah, go ahead. So you're just on mute. <laughs> Thanks. You always forget. Uh, I wanted to deal with uh, China first. Um, China's top banking regulator, Gao Shuqing, stated, um, we will not participate in such sanctions uh, and we continue to maintain normal economic and trade and financial exchanges with all relevant parties. That was in response to the you know, US demand and vote that all countries abide uh, by the imposed sanctions. And after MasterCard and Visa stopped their operations in Russia, which was um, abrupt, <laughs> that really meant everybody even to get on the Metro, you know, suddenly no cards were working. Uh, Russian banks turn to China's Union Pay, which is a platform that offers payment options in 180 countries. Uh, so now there will be intense economic pain, but it, China plays a very important role around the world. Uh, there are um, trade agreements now as part of the Belt and Road that cover, what is it, 180 uh, countries, and they are extremely important. I, I really think in many ways the war on Russia is more focused on how to break and is targeting China very explicitly, and the same encirclement of China is going on. But it, it is, can they create a war, can they create a crisis, and then move it into China? So it's very important at the, at the same time, China continues to have a position for negotiation. They sent just today a, hum, a, a shipment of humanitarian supplies to Ukraine and previously they had a very strong trading relationship. Um, I, I do agree with the points that, that Danny made about the 
Communist Party of the Russian Federation, the statement that I read from them uh, was interesting in that it did not even mention Putin by name, uh, but it absolutely focused on blaming NATO for the war and for calling for defense. Uh, and it seemed an, an appropriate statement for a communist party raised their own demands also uh, within this context and against the uh, attack on pensions in Russia and so on, raised working class demands. So um, that, that struck me, but their, their blame was on NATO and their support uh, was for the two small people's republics in Donetsk and Lugansk who, who really for eight years have been frontline, just absolutely a determined and fighting force. Uh, so anyway, I, I think that's it. And I could comment much more on the Belt and Road, but that's not the uh, focus of today. So I'll, I'll let some of that uh, go. But around the world, there is a new way of surviving these sanctions and countries are increasingly connecting with each other and also finding new platforms and ways to exchange and um, barter and, and whatnot. And in that, uh, China plays an important role. By the way, Iran, Venezuela, a number of other countries also do. Thanks. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, next is Ken on this question, and I think we're going to go on to a question from John Philpot. But Ken, go ahead. I just want to add uh, an observation that was made in the United Nations General Assembly by uh, the permanent ambassador from Syria. His name is uh, Sabag. And uh, it's, he made an observation uh, during the debate in which uh, 141 countries voted uh, to censure Russia for its special military operation in uh, Ukraine. But Syria was one of the five countries that voted against the resolution. And this is what Ambassador Sabag had to say. It's very short, but very pithy. He said, quote, those who show enthusiasm today regarding the defense of the Charter of the United Nations should show their same enthusiasm against Israel's continued occupation of Arab lands and against the Turkish and US forces violation of the sovereignty of Syria. I think he was making a point about the double standard, the hypocrisy that reigns at the United Nations uh, and as was shown by the resolution to condemn Russia, but not to condemn the US and Israel and Turkey for their continued uh, aggressions and occupations. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. So next uh, we have a question here from John Philpot. John is a member of the Sanctions Kill Campaign an international human rights lawyer and um, many other organizations and hats, uh, but John, go ahead with your question. Well, first, congratulations on the organizers, to the organizers. I thoroughly enjoyed many of these presentations, and one of the most important issues to be raised is don't call for Russia to leave Ukraine. In Montreal, they had a bit of that, although there were some good things in the demonstration last Sunday, and there were some bad things. Our One of our struggles with our anti-war colleagues is related to this, I don't know, Cold War thinking, to Russia out also. Why do we not raise the issue that Russia defended Syria in 2015, Russia supports Venezuela, Russia supports Cuba, and I would add, with not complete understanding, Mali against France. And that's something which I'm not an expert on. Although, I mean, so maybe we could, people, anti-war people among this, among this um, panel could uh, comment on whether or not we should raise this aspect to rally some of our friends who are teetering. Thank you. Thank you, John. Who from our panel would like to address uh, this question? 
Danny, go ahead. And then Arnold. That's a very, very good point in terms of getting us to think about how anti-war activists, anti-imperialist activists, how, how we should behave. Because, I mean, if we just look at the source of all of this, if we know that NATO and all that has transpired in Ukraine, in and around Ukraine over the last several decades, we know that the source of this very conflict is not Russia, right? That there has been a brutal massacre and it could be considered a genocide since it is directed toward a particular ethnic group to Russian speaking people in Ukraine in these republics. I mean, we're talking about more than 10,000. Some people say 14,000. There are all sorts of different numbers. Even today, there was a ballistic missile attack on Donetsk that killed at least, I believe, 23 people, women, children, uh, just ordinary people uh, terrorized by Ukraine's military. So there is this question, right? Because I think that there, because of the backlash, because of how tough the backlash has been from all sides of the political spectrum, uh, led by the establishment, by the foreign policy establishment, the imperialists, and then sort of picked up by even large sections of the left, there has been this backlash about, okay, now Russia's doing something bad, so they've jumped on this kind of anti-Russian bandwagon. But we do have to have sort of an objective analysis about not only just what caused this, but what would be the solution if Russia did not intervene, right? What 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 would be the what would be the pri what would I guess be the preferred development that people would want, right? And so this gets into okay, well object we're not anywhere out in front of the objective developments that are happening between Russia, Ukraine, and of course the imperialists that are provoking this crisis. But at the same time, we also have to understand what do we want? Like we obviously should want the Donetsk and Lugansk and the people of Donbass to be to have some form of liberation from this terror because this is a U.S. promoted, U.S. supported massacre, a war that has been going on. So we obviously need to take a position on that. And then we need to say, OK, what should Russia's role be? Should Russia just be standing to the sidelines and say, oh, this is not our problem? Because that's impossible. Should we say that this maybe wasn't the time to do this, right? Because some people have said, oh, well, NATO is unifying and they're losing the propaganda war. In my opinion, that was always going to be lost, right? Because of the concentrated power of the media, Western media, because Russia is not nearly as influential in the information war, is not nearly as is not nearly as powerful as the United States or NATO could be, and and probably will never be, given the balance of forces that exist, and and that's probably a preferred thing. We don't want to see other countries. Right? I think we are seeing a different trend happening worldwide, where Russia and China and a lot of the countries that you mentioned uh, are working together, um, and so. I think there is a reason why countries that are non-aligned with the United States and NATO are hesitant to to uh, go, you know say any, say something bad about this intervention because in part I think it's not that they support war it's that they also understand the untenable situation that is going on and the objective situation is that Russia felt like it had to respond and while we don't while we might not say okay well it's you know, we're not going to we're going to justify the civilian casualties and all of that. We also also have to acknowledge that we don't know what's really happening on the ground. We have some idea. I mean, Arnold brought up the Mariupol, the hospital bombing. It was like a false flag. I mean, it was a propaganda point. It was, you know, the Azov regiment had already emptied out that hospital and was using it for military operations. And then Russia bombed it. And it was that, oh, Russia's bombing women and children. And, you know, this is how deep the propaganda war is. And we can't really know what's happening on the ground. But we can know that something like this is inevitable and that we do have to take a position on the questions that, are just right out in front of us, which is 
what is what, what is our position on Ukraine's war on the east on on its eastern uh, part of the country and of on the uh, republics, right? What is our position on that? And then what is our position on the source of the problem? And the source of the problem is that NATO is literally provoking this and caused this whole problem in the first place, something we could not even have predicted, despite the fact that we had years and years and years of warnings and of just indications that this new Cold War was going to produce hot conflicts, uh, NATO being part of all of them. So, you know, I think that we, as time goes on, we will find out more about the actual social character of this particular conflict, how Russia really engaged in Ukraine and vice versa. And then we will be able to take a, a more, I think, concrete position on that particular issue. But for now, I think there's so many important parts of this conflict that are already out in the open that have been part of the historical record that we can just get out in front of now. And we should do that. Arnold? Yes, I'd like to respond uh, on the chat. One of my old friends from the late 1960, Abe Rosner asked the question twice and he wants it to be asked. I know he's asking it uh, in a friendly way. Okay, because he's a progressive person. What you know, he's, what he says specifically is, oh, we know uh, NATO and the United States and all that, the aggression. That's an old story. But what do you think about Russian invasion of Ukraine? Firstly, to say that NATO, just brush that aside, NATO, that's an old story. Yes, it is an old story. If you just take since the end of World War II, the United States, Hiroshima, Hit the, uh, atomic bombs against Hiroshima, Vietnam, Korea, Latin America. You, there's been a constant U.S.-led aggression against the peoples of the world, including uh, Soviet Union, Latin America, Asia, etc. That is not, it's an old story, and is it not the time to stop it? Secondly, Abe is asking in a friendly way, what do we think uh, what do I think of the uh, invasions of Russia? So I will ask Abe, you know me since the 1960s. Am I a coward? Why am I at, why I'm asking that? Because as far as my view is, for a Canadian in 2022, while all this hysterical propaganda disinformation is being carried out by the mainstream media, Ottawa, Washington, CNN, against Russia, for a Canadian to say, oh, I'm also against Russian invasion. That is a position of a coward. I'm not talking about people on the street who are not aware of all the situation. I'm talking about activists, people who consider themselves to be left and progressive. To take a stand now, say Russia should get out, it's a position of a coward. And it's even more cowardly coming from someone who's supposedly on the left. Now, you know, with regards to Russian invasion, one could just discuss here, even here, whether, for example, was whether it was tactically right for what Russia to do was to do. My view on that, now I hope this people don't think take this as being me being insensitive to what's happening in Ukraine at this time, the hundreds of people who are being killed, millions being displaced, etc. But we have to look at the current situation, Russian's decision, as part of the overall resistance to US-led aggression since World War II. And what is taking place in Ukraine, once again, I don't want to sound like I'm diminishing the suffering that's going on there, but it is very, it's minimal, it's small compared to what the United States has done all over the world, especially in third world countries, but also in Yugoslavia and Europe. So please, in Canada, we have, should only have one position as Canadians that we oppose NATO, we oppose US aggression, and that's it. Why do leftists need to say, oh, I'm also against Russian invasion? You have to be a, a coward to do so. Sorry for the harsh words, Abe, I think you understand. We can continue discussing this later. Thank you. So, uh... <laughs> Thanks, Arnold. Uh, that was a, a question that wasn't exactly asked. I think I want to bring our discussion uh, back actually to NATO. Um, 
and uh, back to uh, hearing from panelists about why does NATO exist today? If it was created in order to uh, serve as a defense pact against the Soviet Union, what, why does NATO still exist today? Further than that, if Ukraine is not even part of NATO, why is the US and other countries arming NATO? And, um, uh, sorry, arming Ukraine. <laughs> And uh, also just to say, um, I, I think we'll end there. So just is, so can someone address why does NATO exist today? Sarah, you wanna go ahead? Yeah, I, I hope I have, I wanna answer a few things, but let's start with why does NATO exist? Uh, from the very beginning, and this is, we're talking about the Cold War, but why it continued why it continued, because it was to enforce the private property relations in the formerly socialist countries. It was to enforce US domination. The, the famous Wolfowitz Doctrine at uh, 1991, which was there will be no other power to compete or contend with the US that can arise. And this was directed at the European Union also was directed at Russia, it was directed at China, it was directed at Iran, it was directed at there can be no challenge to US power. And the NATO military machine is the enforcer. It's not just an association, it is a military war machine. It enforces private property, capitalist relations in the East European countries. When you join NATO, you don't just salute, the entire military has to be turned over to the US. They got to get all US equipment, go through US training, take part in US wars. They're the cannon fodder in Iraq and in Afghanistan. Their casualties don't even count. They count US casualties, NATO members don't count. So NATO is the military machine, the enforcer big time. It also, continued in order to be a weapon against Russia. And that is an absolute fact. And it's just stated by every possible official. Uh, this war wasn't just planned even from the, from the fascist coup uh, in the Ukraine, but the whole reason for, for encircling Russia was to dismember Russia, to do what they did to the Yugoslav Federation, to do that to Russia, to break it up into little pieces. Uh, Russia is the, the large, you know, in, in oil and in gas and wheat and raw materials. It's a capitalist country. Yes, it's not an imperialist country. It doesn't have access to big global banking or markets. It exports raw materials and the US wants direct control of that. So uh, I, I think that's really important. And also the question comes up, people demand, oh, Russian troops out. Oh, you have to have an equal hand. If Russia got out of Ukraine today, that would just be handing it over to the fascists, to the mercenaries. And, and that is the dilemma. That's the problem that even Russia faces because the US is just pumping in more and more mercenaries. Look at that base that got hit today. It was entirely mercenaries, paid $2,000 a day. They were bringing in a minimum of 20,000 of them. That base got destroyed. Okay, that, does that mean it'll stop? Does that mean all these weapons will stop? It certainly doesn't. Now, what were Russia's demands? From, from the very beginning, it was late December of, of 2021, when Putin made it clear in statement after statement, he said, we are not coming to your borders. You are right on our border, firing weapons. Back up. That's all he said, back up. Negotiate, abide by the Minsk Accords and so on and so forth. The US refused and said, oh, Putin must be a, um, a madman. You see, he's insane. He's making demands. He's calling on NATO to disband and so on. So. From the beginning, this struggle has really played a role. There is, it's not only, by the way, to disband, to destroy, to dismember Russia, but Russia 
Syria would not have survived without Russian assistance. That's a fact, it's a fact. And it's important, whether it was done as international solidarity or it was also in Russia's interests, nevertheless, Syria would not have survived. And there's an important role in Cuba and in Venezuela and many, many other places. If they can dismember Russia, what will that mean for China? What will that mean around the world? So I, I think it's, um, important for the anti-war movement to really address and think through the demands when it's raised. Oh, Russian troops should get out. Hand it over, hand it over to these fascist bands. <clears throat> I wanna say one other thing, when it comes to the bombing of hospitals, like in Maripol, I, I was in hospitals being bombed in Yugoslavia, also just after bombing in Iraq, in Syria. Now the US has bombed hospitals again and again. I remember we did a book on, on Yugoslavia, listed the names of the 33 hospitals and the 430 schools that had been bombed by the US. But the hospitals, the, I remember going to a hospital, we picked our way on, on flagstones because it had been completely littered with uh, shrapnel bomblets. It took a step off of one of these paths, you would have been blown apart. That was done to the entryway of the, of the emergency room of the hospital, a hospital in operation. So this, these are the US tactics. And, and in Iraq, every hospital was targeted. And, and we do know it for Syria. So this is, these are, when there's a rewriting of history, when the banner headlines are just relentlessly, Russia has bombed a hospital, even though it was well known, it was an empty, there were no patients, not doctors, it was a firing range for fascist forces. So anyway, there are lots of points to address in here that are different than the ones I was thinking of, but um, war came to Russia in the form of NATO and, <laughs> can they, can a country, does a country have a right to defend itself? That's how I think it comes down. Thank you, Sarah. And I know um, really truly, I will say the amount of questions is quite overwhelming. I mean, it shows how important this discussion is. We could go on for much longer than we will. I do have a handful of questions. Uh, I think we'll do three more that we wanna address before we wrap up for tonight. But I must mention uh, that our interpreter for tonight, who's continuing to do uh, excellent interpretation to French, will be leaving in five minutes. So I apologize to anyone that's been participating in French. The interpretation uh, will unfortunately um, not be uh, continuing after that time. Um, but uh, thank you all. <laughs> I, I next uh, have Ken and then Ali and then Danny who wanted to say something on this question of NATO. Ken? I think that Sarah has said it all. I'll pass on that. Ali, you are next. You are on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I think also Sarah said uh, a very complete uh, response. But I just want to elaborate more on that. Uh, one about the uh, 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 why U.S. Uh, you know uh, U.S. NATO uh, against Russia. Uh, beside uh, uh, the the perspective of uh, exploitation and plundering the resources of Russia, uh, Russia has another aspect that most people do not uh, discuss because that is not in the in the uh, discussion usually. And that is that, the, in my opinion, the, the, the most important part of that animosity of US and NATO against Russia is the Russia's potential and capability of become a second China. That is what really uh, the question is, because within this, uh, what I call it, the, the new war of the new era of war and occupation, which started from 2001, it was an indication of that 
the capitalist-imperialist countries, specifically U.S., do not have any other leverage to uh, tackle their uh, their problems, the economical market and and capital and every problem that they are facing. So they started that, that wars with all these countries. <clears throat> Russia uh, basically is beyond all this because it, we have to look at the, how politics is working in the world. The, the dynamics of politics in the world, uh, it goes through three countries uh, uh, from point of view of defense. And that is China, Russia, and Iran, because these are the three countries that constantly create dynamics of motions and counter motions in, in, in politics. Russia, uh, the, in my opinion, Russia is a capitalist country, but I call it a deformed capitalist country because within, within the potential and capa capabilities, intellectual capacity, industrialization, and technology that Russia has cannot, it, it cannot be contained in what it is right now because this, uh, this has to grow, he did grow. This has to go beyond Russia. And that is what comes, the main conflict between Russia and China, uh, sorry, Russia uh, and the US, the same conflict that already exists and getting worse between uh, the US and, and China. And Russia cannot be an imperialist country. Russia, does, Russia does not uh, uh, export a monopoly capital. It is not, and even the Russia intervention, uh, military intervention in, in Ukraine is a war of defense. It's not war of offense. Russia did not go to, to Ukraine to plunder the resources. Russia didn't go to, uh, to, uh, uh, to, to Ukraine in, in, in order to export the, uh, the finance capital and monopoly capital to take over their banks, take over the industry. Russia went there to defense its existence, to, to defense its future. That is very important to understand Russia, the difference between uh, the Russian and an imperialist country. Uh, just because, uh, you know, like it's an old uh, habit a little bit that uh, whoever that we don't like politically, either they're imperialists or fascists. You know, these are the scientific, uh, 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 the scientific terminology, and it had to be seen such as, as, as such. The other thing about uh, that someone uh, I saw that uh, about the questions that uh, uh, as if that I said uh, China is capitalist. I never said China is capitalist. I said China use market system for development. And that is uh, uh, very different to be a, a, a capitalist when a country that is still have a huge a, a, control, a, a government and a state that huge control over uh, industry and or, over the resources and over everything. And also the Communist Party of China, which is basically in charge of all this development. That is very different situation uh, than uh, Russia. The other issue that uh, discussed a little bit, but I just want to put it here to see what people are thinking is the issue of self-determination and sovereignty. I know that people, especially, uh, the, you know, uh, p uh, peace-loving people and many progressives and intellectuals, they really are, are sensitive about this self-determination. But state boundaries and self-determination is not a giving God, God right and can be changed. In, 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 uh, for example, in the, uh, uh, with Ukraine, can change because of politics, because of the relationship of forces, because of the balance of forces, because many, many different uh, 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 different uh, uh, reasons. So we can uh, discuss that how how uh, the Ukraine that once was an oppressed nationality 
decades ago had become a tool of imperialists uh, to, be, to become a, 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 a jumping dive for imperialist countries to, to, to contain and move against Russia. But self-determination uh, is something that we can discuss more that why uh, Ukra Ukraine basically lost it with becoming a tale of imperialists. And Dana, Danny, sorry, you're next. <laughs> no, that's okay. I'll be brief. I just wanted to elaborate a, a little bit upon Sarah, what Sarah said, because it was all very, I mean, the points were just very good. Uh, one of the things that I thought about as she was talking, though, was uh, how NATO is really all about full spectrum dominance. And she outlined why just uh, with all of the various examples. And I think it's so interesting because not only is Russia and China part of this campaign for full spectrum dominance, it's they are targeted, their rise is targeted for this containment, this great power competition, but also Europe and really the entire world, right? Any country that decides to chart its own course of development and any sort of block, even the EU is sort of restricted to be just merely a junior partner of the United States and NATO plays a huge role in that. We're seeing this now where the United States is willing to starve Europe and then dump its expensive energy onto Europe just so it can continue on this policy of trying to undermine and then eventually overthrow Russia. And so th there is this one part I wanted to add on is that NATO is really an instrument both of this Cold War and of, of racism. I mean, it is literally through its military uh, operations and expansion enforcing the Eurocentric American imperialist uh, model of white supremacy on the entire planet. And we see this so clearly in the propaganda war on Russia right now, where Russia is being portrayed as this Asiatic uh, sort of horde that is invading white Ukraine, European Ukraine, in order to just essentially uh, take the first step toward rebuilding its uh, empire of, of the past. And what's so interesting about that is actually the United States, NATO, and alliance could care less about Ukraine as a so-called white country. And this is where I think we have to uh, really be clear. N Ukraine, it, I mean, it makes, I mean, it's a really good point to say Ukraine is not, is an, a, an unofficial member of NATO. So it's a really good point to, to, to say it because there is a lot of evidence of that. But the fact that it is not an official member of NATO, and even under these conditions, are, it, you know, there is not going to be any fast tracking of NATO membership or European Union membership demonstrates that NATO does not look at Ukraine as a European country. It looks upon Ukraine as a vassal state, nothing but a puppet state, nothing but merely a tool for its objectives, one that has to remain weak. After the coup, it wasn't just the political situation that deteriorated, uh, where these Nazi forces gained more power, especially in the military, and you know parties were banned, and Essentially, any kind of democracy was just obliterated in Ukraine after 2014, but it was also the economy that was obliterated. The IMF plundered. Uh, Ali made, made this point clear about imperialism. I mean, what happened after 2014? That's imperialism. The, uh, the IMF plundered the economy, and there was an immediate economic crisis that only until the last few years has it slowly climbed out of, but still it's a very dire situation. So Ukraine is not at all a European country. That's all just propaganda to get people to support war on Russia. And that's what NATO is all about. It's about full spectrum dominance and promoting uh, these endless wars, which really do threaten humanity as a whole. Thank you, Danny, Ali, Sarah, for addressing that question. Um, another thread of questions we have, as I said, we're gonna we'll take a few more. There's lots of people on, and this is an important discussion. Um, is along the line of, of kind of the one of the reasons we had this webinar, which is that uh, the 
opinions, the perspective being discussed, this anti-war position being discussed is not being presented in mainstream media. It is also not being presented in media because of uh, active censorship that has happened. Um, so there's a question here uh, referring to uh, the fact that the McDonald Laurier Institute has been investigative, uh, has been revealed uh, to be pushing Canada to ban Russia Today or RT television. Um, we know now that it has been banned in Canada. We have, you know, the Empire Files from Abby Martin has now been removed from YouTube or just all sorts of different acts of censorship really taking place around uh, this uh, push for war with Russia. So uh, the question is, in the face of this censorship and um, moves by the US government, the government of Canada, how do we respond? Uh, someone here has referred to it so the, the NATO-led Iron Curtain. And then another uh, question is also in, in academia. A few people have said, you know, there's professors that have said, uh, has made it known that an anti-war position against war with Russia is not acceptable. So uh, how do we respond to the censorship of this anti-war position? beyond this webinar, which I think is one of those important responses. Someone like to address this? Ken, go ahead. I think we have to build a movement, an anti-war movement. Um, to address this, and we need to build up alongside the anti-war movement uh, an anti-war media. Uh, there, are, Fire This Time is a good example of that. Uh, Canada Files is a good example of that. Um, we, uh, j just as an example uh, from this, uh, this workshop, uh, this webinar, uh, the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War with the Help of Just Peace Advocates sent out a media release to 800 media outlets in Canada, 800. There was not a single response from any of them. And we've, we've noted over the years that whereas there used to be space uh, uh, on CBC, for example, or even Global sometimes, or sometimes the CTV, um, there was space for uh, anti-war views to be heard say back around the time of the war on Iraq, the, there isn't any more space given at all to an anti-war view concerning Syria or Yemen or, or any of the other wars of the US empire right now. Um, and the, in, the, in, the, in the press, the same is true. Uh, it's, it's getting increasingly difficult to get a, an op-ed piece or a letter to the editor into newspapers um, in, to show an alternate view, uh, the anti-war view against the, uh, the wars that are being waged by Canada, uh, along with the US, um, against the people of Yemen, against the people of Syria and Iraq, uh, against the people of, of Haiti, for example. Um, so um, I would encourage people who are on this call to join one of the organiz sponsoring organizations that put on this event and to, be, and to become involved in building the organizations that are going to carry on the struggle. And uh, in building these organizations, we will develop the, uh, the means to be able to get our word out. And it'll be things like this webinar. It'll be things like uh, uh, Fire This Time and uh, the Canada Files. And we will, you know, if we have to create, uh, you know, uh, committees to write letters to the editor where we can get them in or op-ed pieces, we'll do that as well. Um, but it's, it's part of a building of movement. There's no easy way, there's no quick fix to this unless somebody comes along and buys a new, with a million dollars and buys a newspaper or a TV station. Um, we should use the, the, the means that are available to us, for example, uh, on community radio, there's a guerrilla radio in Victoria. There's we have a stage, we have a radio program here in Hamilton called Unusual Sources, which is broadcast uh, every Wednesday from five to six p.m. Uh, the Taylor Report reports from Toronto. There's uh, um, Robin Philpot's uh, uh, show in uh, Montreal. So we have 
the, the beginnings of an alternate media in this country, one that can put out an anti-war view. And we need more people to get involved, contribute money, contribute their time, and it will get bigger. Thank you, Ken. Ali? Sorry, you're on mute again. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, I couldn't be more in agreement with uh, Ken. Uh, absolutely said um, very, very correctly. And um, it, I just want to uh, a little bit elaborate after what Ken finished. Uh, it's not just only that. It's not just uh, we are, uh, sorry, I think something happened in my computer. Like, uh, it's not only that, that, uh, that imperialist uh, and social media, uh, they exclude us, that they are doing their job. That's what they're supposed to do. Uh, they are representing the interest of capitalist and imperialist class. But we cannot, that is the whole point, that we cannot rely on them and rely on the social media that is, that is run by capitalists and imperialists. This is a kind of uh, a little bit visual <laughs> thinking that through that, that we can build a movement. Why? Because politics changes by numbers, does, does not change by ideas only. You can talk about ideas. What changes in history, what, cha what changed that we have a great example, anti-Vietnam War movement. It took 10 years, yes, 10 years. But then millions of people came to the street and, um, and US imperialist ruling class could not afford to continue war, especially with the great heroic resilience and defense and fight back what uh, with Vietnamese revolutionaries and the Vietnamese uh, army uh, against uh, the US imperialism. So the point here is that we have to build a movement as exactly what Ken said. And that movement, when it becomes a big number, then you can talk about change. Because I, I saw it in my own eyes. Uh, I, I'm privileged and I was privileged to participate in a revolution. And the revolution is exactly that, that 100,000 millions of people, millions, not two or three or four, 20, 25 million people come out in one day to change the history, to finish the, the rule of the capitalist class in favor of oppressed and ordinary and people. That is what is going to happen for this, then, then we have to think how we are going to work with each other. How does this happen? How can, how can build a movement when we are so fragmented? We are all of us progressive, left, socialist, communist, revolutionary, revolution. They're all small groups. Even if you're 500, an organization with 500 members, you're small, look at, the magnitude and the power that capitalist media and capitalist class, the money that they have they can use against us for deceiving and manipulating uh, working class, uh, working people, oppressed people. So we need to work together. We need unity, not on everything, not on everything. We have to develop united front. That means on the issues that we agree, we have a mutual interest, mutual agreement to work together in order to be able to bring masses to the street, masses to the organization. And that is what the unity makes. Fidel always talk about unity. You, it, it's maybe 80% of Fidel's speeches somehow directly or indirectly is about 
unity, the unity that we oppressed people, that we working people must have in order to be able to have a presence. I want to talk to uh, fellow activists and co-fighters, but all of you, we do not have presence. Imperialists, capitalists, they have presence every second. How? We have to think about it honestly. Put everything, sectarianism, factionalism, all these little you know, uh, problems and disagreements aside to see in what way we can build a united front together against war, against the oppression, against uh, occupation, against sanction, uh, against poverty, against homelessness, against the oppression and suppression of indigenous people, not only in Canada, around the world. And, and the most burning issue of the class struggle today that connects to everything, connects itself to, to race, to poverty, and to democratic and human rights. And that is the issue of environmental degradation that we are all under attack. So think about the way that we can come together. Let's develop more a concept that already been used by Bolsheviks, but many other groups successfully united front together, as Ken said, we have to put effort. It's not gonna happen like this. It, it has to be an effort. It has to be a, a level of sacrifice that we can see the movement is moving. That is a consistency. That is a constant work. We can't always talk about good things and bad things. Like Mark said, we are not here just talk about, you, you know, uh, about the way that politics and the society is or to interpret it, interpret that. We are here to change it. Then we have to ask ourselves how change is possible. We have the tools, we have the program, we need to come together. Thank you. Um, Arnold, I believe, wanted to add, and, and Sarah, to this question. Yeah, I would, I would like to add my voice to um, Ken and others who've raised the issue of alternative media. I think it's very important. Uh, the current situation in Canada, United States, in the West, the ruling circles have a virtual airtight control of the thinking to the extent it is almost impossible to say something that goes against the official narrative that the problem is Russia and not NATO. However, we have a positive side coming out of it, and that is the alternative media. I can mention uh, several, such as uh, Fire This Time, uh, the Canada Files uh, in Canada. I also would ask at the uh, uh, International Manifesto Group organizes webinars similar to this one to favor uh, voices that oppose U.S. imperialism, and we're we're very privileged to have someone in this webinar from the Black Agenda Report in the United States, Danny. And there are many similar such outlets in the United States, but I specifically would uh, suggest uh, people follow Danny and the Black Agenda Report in the United States. They do excellent work, and there's others as well, like Orinoco Tribune based in, in, uh, in Venezuela, and Camila Escalante's outlook, very, very good reporting uh, based in Bolivia. So what are the possibilities of further developing our collaboration uh, amongst the different outlets in Canada, United States, Bolivia, uh, uh, and, uh, and Venezuela? I think this would be uh, this the whole, very holding of this webinar shows that it's possible because we just we we pulled it off. It worked well. Um, there's over you know almost 200 participants. It's very good. And so how can we further develop this mutual collaboration 
that uh, that helps everyone involved in our common effort to have a voice that goes against the dominant U.S. Uh, imposed position on what is happening in the world today. Thank you, Arnold. And uh, Sarah, you're next. I just wanted to let folks know that um, after Sarah, then we'll make a few more announcements and then I'll be asking all the speakers to uh, provide closing comments, uh, wrap up, say anything urgent they believe uh, needs to be addressed and we will wrap up for tonight's webinar. Uh, but Sarah, go ahead on this question. This, boy, what an incredible discussion. I think everyone who's here, just tremendous. Um, and it's kind of exciting to be speaking after Ali and Arnold's um, comments on the media. Um, so I, I won't, um, but I, I thought uh, Ali, especially talking about how explosive change can be when it breaks through. And, and always have that perspective in the back of our minds. It's a complete lockdown now in the media. And we shouldn't be surprised by media censorship. We should never accept it. We should challenge it. We should denounce it, absolutely. But we shouldn't be surprised or bowled over by it. Uh, the media is the voice for corporate power in the US. And it's always the voice of the ruling class in every country and every society. And it exists to also marginalize and divide any opposition. That's its role. So, and especially when the ruling class is united and they are today in the US, Democrat and Republican, and it's no different in Canada, in Britain, little different in Europe right now. But when they are united, they only, only put out their view and everything else is shut down. Uh, but I, when I say we shouldn't accept it now, there are all kinds of union resolutions, messages that need to happen, uh, preparing simple literature that is in the interests of working people, uh, simple handouts, uh, organizing actions, that's really key because you're gathering uh, to you those who are willing to fight in hard times and they'll take you much further. Uh, and then things will begin to break apart because this war is an impossibility and it's gonna take a huge toll in living conditions right here, not only in Russia, not only in Ukraine, the poorest country now of, of Europe, but it will take a big toll here all everything that Biden promised about build back better and money for COVID relief, they, they just took it right out of the budget. Instead, it's going for weapons for Ukraine. Boom, it was decided in, in a few minutes, backroom deal. Uh, there are a lot of analogies that have been made to the current situation and World War I. I think we've all heard them again and again, but let's remember that at the beginning of World War I, and there was a huge socialist movement at that time, working class in Europe, they all considered themselves socialists. And yet in the war, they went along, each of them with their own ruling class. And those who stood up were a handful. Now, some of what's going on today is people all over and this is true for US, it's true Britain, Canada, are finding each other. And who's willing to stand up, explain this, use the voice that they have, isn't so surprised by it, uh, that's important. So I, I think this, this meeting is incredibly, it's fascinating for me because I'm not usually on a program with Canadian voices. So I, this is like a, a new, um, dimension, although it's the same uh, in so many ways, because really Canada and Britain today function as junior partners of U.S. imperialism. So at any rate, I, I think um, we should use every form that we can and also use this as a time, as I say, for new resolutions, new motions that we can get passed. When you 
get up at a meeting, no one may agree with you, but it's a platform to raise your voice and for people to know there's an opposition. Now that's important because that's who people remember to come back to. Uh, and we're not totally shut down from the media. We just don't have the bigger voice that we had before. But there's a big shutdown being that that is happening. RT and Sputnik News and lots of uh, channels and Twitter channels and so on are being shut down. So, um, but we're, I think all determined, we're all going to keep going and yeah. we're certainly showing it. So. Yeah, well, I'm building building a, a more united, stronger cross border anti war movement. I mean, we right. are very close to each other in a lot of uh, ways, including a very long border. So it's great to have you here. Um, I've mentioned I'm going to make a few announcements. So as I do so uh, to the speakers to the panel, I say, uh, take a look through the questions and any of the comments, make sure you know what you'd like to address in your closing remarks. Uh, there is kind of a, a question out there that I think would be good to, to answer together, which is uh, what are our demands as anti-war activists at this time? Um, what is the road to peace, as some people have been referring to in the chat? And I think it'd be good to reiterate um, on that point as we close for tonight. And yes, there will be future events. The next uh, Announcement I have is for Canada Days of Action on Ukraine, which is happening March 19th and 20th. Groups across Canada are calling to demand a ceasefire and a negotiated solution now. All foreign forces and weapons out of Ukraine, no to a no-fly zone in NATO expansion. We say yes to peace, neutrality, and nuclear disarmament. This day of action is taking place again. Um, March 19th and 20th, and I'm putting the information in the chat uh, for hopefully how people can find out if there's something happening in their city. Uh, if there are other events happening, please feel free to put them in the chat, including our co-fighters that are joining here from the United States. Also, March 26th, 2022, marking seven years of the brutal war in Yemen. Anti-war and peace activists and organizations across Canada are holding a Canada Stop Arming Saudi Arabia Day of Action on March 26th. I'm going to put in the chat a website to find out more information about events that may be happening in your city, or if they're not, and you want support and would like to organize something, uh, there's contact information on that website as well. Again, thank you to our, co our sponsors, a media sponsor, The Canada Files co-sponsors, the United National Anti-War Coalition, UNAC, the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War, the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, the Orinoco Tribune, the International Manifesto Group, Mobilization Against War and Occupation, MAWO, the Regina Peace Council, and the International Action Center. We'll go ahead in the order of speakers uh, for our closing comments. Uh, Danny has had to leave us. Uh, he has a, a family and, and had to leave the webinar. Um, so that means, Arnold, you are first. Yeah, I'll be very brief. Uh, also, partially to continue the exchange with my friend, uh, Abe Roster, who refined his question asking, okay, uh, I understand why we are not opposed, we're not speaking out against Russian invasion, but he wants to know, and correctly so, I think it's a fair question, why now? Why did Russia decide now to take this military action and not several years ago? It's a fair question. Here's my take. With the pandemic, the entire world situation changed. Two things happened in the capitalist countries, such as Canada and the United States, it became increasingly evident to the people here that the capitalist system, neoliberalism, is not able to solve the basic problems facing the people, such as health. At the same time, in the course of this pandemic, a new force arose in the world scale, that is socialist China. And despite all the disinformation, it was very hard for imperialism to hide the fact that China has a way to deal with the issue of pandemic and many other issues. And in the course of the rise of China over the last 
couple of years, we see increasing collaboration between Russia, China, Iran. And this is a further impulse uh, in favor of a multipolar world, which began before the uh, pandemic, but has increased drastically during the course of the pandemic. And ironically, American Canadian aggression against Russia, despite themselves, the, what is happening is this push for a multipolar world is stronger now than it was February 24th, and is bound to increase. People, you know, we saw the great decoupling of Russia from the West. It's all over. Russia, China, uh, 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 Iran, and from North, uh, South America, the South American countries, by the way, have taken a stand against the uh, US aggression with regards to Russia. So you have the further building of the multipolar world uh, which is very promising for all of us here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Arnold. Uh, and next is uh, Sarah. Uh, well, I'm gonna circle back to, uh, there was a question I think we didn't answer uh, and I kept meaning to um, asking about uh, the anti-war movement uh, in Russia. It gets a lot of publicity here, uh, of course, no surprise. Now, one thing that we know, and there's been, of course, a lot of research on this in Ukraine and speakers mentioned it today, but throughout all of the East European countries, in the Balkans, certainly in Ukraine and also in Russia, there was a very important, pervasive US AID, um, uh, NED, National Endowment for Democracy funded program to establish thousands, tens of thousands of NGOs that play a whole role in social life, that rewrote property laws, constitutions, moral codes, funded religious groups, and sometimes even provided socially useful in the immediate sense because these countries were collapsing uh, from the formerly socialist world. You have hundreds of thousands of people who receive training in the West, uh, full course, lots of money, staff, uh, there was a real bragging in the Ukraine that there were 40,000 such organizations. Now you can see the sheer number of staff and funding and money and people who've had been training in Berlin and Paris and New York and Washington and so on. This is what creates the, the cultural social shift. Um, I remember years ago uh, writing an article because there was a piece of legislation in the Russian Duma saying that 400,000 US and foreign funded and corporate funded organizations existed in Russia and every one of them had to register as a receiver of foreign funds. They tried to rein it in um, and they had some success and then it surged forward again but there is a real effort to create a voice that speaks for the West, that is imbued in and that looks to the imperialist countries that consciously sabotages and uh, works against their own country. Uh, that really exists. Also, in any time of war, there's confusion and uh, everyone desires peace, everyone, but what it means in the big picture, we need to, to realize. And it gets played up here. Uh, I, I saw one article where they described an anti-war uh, demonstration and, and someone else pointed out, no, no it's, it's, you don't see one sign in this crowd they're showing. Um, I don't know, I wasn't, I wasn't there, but I'm just saying some of this is real. 
Some of it is fiction. We do know in every country, certainly you look at Venezuela, Nicaragua, Cuba, where they've defined this, the creation of organizations that operate for the US and that have funding and coordination from the US. So that does exist in Russia today, yes, and we shouldn't be um, surprised. Um, I think I'll really end with saying um, imperialism can't solve the most basic problems of life. I believe this week will reach in the United States a million who died of COVID. That's what, there's no social health, national health program here. Uh, and you could also say that why does Ukraine have the highest rate of COVID deaths and infections and the lowest vaccination rate in Europe? But why does the US have such the worst in the world, the most uh, deaths in the world? It's because there just is no social infrastructure. There is a vast repressive inf infrastructure. Um, so in testing, and in vaccines and in just getting back to people and connecting with people for health, no infrastructure really that exists. On the other hand, you can get fingerprinted and an iris scan and have the results any police department within three minutes. So repressive apparatus exists, social apparatus does not exist. And that condition is getting much, much worse and it will give rise to really a sharply changing consciousness. No matter what poll they do today in the United States, people are not for war. They can say, are you, oh, are you for a no-fly zone? Oh yeah, sounds good. Sounds like something in the air. Are you for sanctions? Oh yeah. But as soon as you mention could be war, it's, a, it's an overwhelming no. So they try to dress it up with fancy words. Um, I think people aren't buying it and we should, just hang on to that, keep going. Thank you, Sarah. Um, next is Ken. I just wanted, there's a few other uh, things I've been added to the chat, uh, including the Twitter handles for our speakers here tonight, if you want to follow them on Twitter and uh, a few other comments, uh, including a statement issued jointly by the Virginia Defenders for Freedom, Justice and Equality, the Odessa Solidarity Campaign, the Fire This Time Movement for Social Justice, endorsed by the Canada Files and the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War. Um, it's a statement on the present crisis in Ukraine. As well as uh, the statement from the Hamilton Coalition to Stop the War has also uh, been posted in the chat. So I encourage people to read those and to share them. Uh, Ken, you are next. Uh, once again, I'd like to follow the uh, sterling example of Sarah Flounders and try and answer a question that was not answered, to my knowledge, during the uh, during the Q and A. It kept coming up, and it was about bio labs in uh, Ukraine. And I'd like to share some information that I got via the Taylor Report, which is broadcast uh, every Monday from five to six p.m. Uh, host Phil Taylor on CIT dot fm at the university of toronto you can pick it up online uh, what uh what was shared with us on that program uh today was that there are indeed bio labs in ukraine u.s bio labs in ukraine uh this was confirmed by none other than victoria newland the architect of the uh she was under an undersecretary of state for the u.s and she was the architect of the uh, coup in Ukraine in 2014. So she should know. She acknowledged that the Ukraine has bio labs and she was concerned that these bio labs might fall into the hands of the Russians. Um, the World Health Organization uh, confirmed that there are 26 bio labs they know of in Ukraine. And I think that's a pretty reliable source. And they contracted, they contacted the Ukrainian government on February 24th to request destruction of dangerous toxins that were being held and produced in these biolabs. According to the uh, government of China, the US maintains 336 biolabs in 30 countries under its control. And it has also conducted many experiments at Fort Dietrich 
in the United States. Also, the Chinese complain that the US has stood in the way of international cooperation on bioweapons and denied verification of its facilities for more than 20 years. So one may ask, why does the US maintain biolabs in, in uh, Ukraine? Probably that it's it, probably safe, uh, they don't wanna, it's safer uh, to uh, maintain them in Ukraine, which uh, is a vassal state of uh, the, U, the US rather than in the US proper, probably couldn't get away with it in the US. But it's part of a bigger pro program of uh, uh, the of the uh, dominate of the intention, the purpose of the U.S. Go government, which is to increase the empire of the U.S., the domination of the U.S. over the entire planet, which domination is not intended to benefit the people of the U.S. or the people of the world, but rather just a tiny minority of people. So I'll finish by echoing what Danny Haifong said at the very beginning of the webinar, Russia is not the problem. Russia is not the cause of the situation in Ukraine. Russia is not the enemy. The enemy of peace in the world is the US empire. And uh, in Canada, uh, it's, the, in Canada, it's the, the ruling class that is a willing accomplice of this empire. What we have to do in Canada is to get out of NATO. What we have to do in Canada is to develop an independent foreign policy. And so hopefully uh, this uh, webinar is a step in that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. And uh, last to wrap up for tonight is Ali Yerevani. Ali? Yes. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> um, yes, I, I agree. That sounds very interesting that you uh, participate in a webinar that almost you, I, you agree on every uh, position uh, with uh, other participants. And that is uh, by itself is a very good start uh, to build a movement of uh, as I mentioned before, a united front, uh, building anti-war uh, anti movement uh, against the, the, the war occupation sanctions is a united front. It, uh, building it, it, it against the creation of um, uh, environment is a united front. Uh, you might not have the same ideology or the same idea or the same exper political exper uh, 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 experience, but there are issues, burning issues, that the only way we can be present in society and we can change this is the only way is that we become a movement because only movement changes the world and history. We can go and look at all the movements, at least, I'm not saying about 5,000 years, just take it in the last 200 years. <clears throat> so just to, uh, to summarize what uh, I understood uh, from our, our, our uh, presentation and discussion is uh, Russia, uh, I'm just, I just started where again, we can uh, uh, finish and also uh, the, uh, Andrew, uh, 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 the Arnold uh, uh, explanation uh, were really great because uh, put, uh, it helped me to put things together. Uh, Russia, Russia military intervention is a war of defense. There is a difference between war of defense and war of offense, the war that US and imperialists are doing. Russia is defending itself. It's that's why they call it war of defense. <clears throat> no matter is look like it's military moving and oppression, but you need to know exactly what is the meaning of that military move. And that is a war of defense. Ukraine is not an innocent country 
an innocent ruling class uh, that just uh, suddenly uh, occupied uh, uh, by uh, uh, by Russia, uh, but is is a tool uh, of imperialists right now. Is a tool of imperialists uh, against Russia, and also uh, it, it, a tool for Cold War II expansion in Europe and around the world. Is part of it already has become part of that. Uh, uh, expansion of Cold War uh, in Europe and beyond. U.S., this is very important uh, because it comes to, to all this uh, uh, propaganda by imperialist media. U.S. NATO uh, planned and executed war and destruction in Ukraine. And this is did not happen 19, year, uh, 19 days ago. It started but even the repression was from 2004, 2005. But in action started a civil war in, in Ukraine from 2014, which they knew what would be the end result of these provocations and this civil war. <clears throat> the, goal of, the goal of US NATO uh, is not uh, to help again Ukraine, the goal of the, the the main goal of right now in this stage of uh, development of U.S. NATO is to prolong the war, to inflict as much as damage and killing is possible, uh, uh, open people of uh, uh, the Ukraine and also Russian army and soldiers. This is what, they don't want this to finish. They don't want to go to negotiation. They want this to continue another six months, another one year to completely, to be able to put themselves in a better position against uh, Russia. <clears throat> NATO is backbone of the new Cold War. And we have to understand that the expansion of NATO that started at, at 10 years ago, and now it's not only in Europe. Your NATO was built to, to defend the, the capitalism and, and democracy against Soviet Union. Right now, it is, an, is a membership all, membership all around the world and is actually, it is a have a plan to become a completely a world aggressive, a dominate a military organization. <laughs> Uh, and we, and we are, we 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 saw to, to the, tonight that we have a, a good base and foundation of to work with each other, and that is the way that we can come together and start from Canada, U.S. and a strong mass movement, anti-war, uh, uh, anti-war movement, uh, and. Um, <clears throat> All I can say that we hope that I, I hope that and uh, we can continue this discussion and we can uh, have more uh, meetings that we put uh, uh, on the table each uh, each of us the uh, the capacity capability and the material that we have to help to to build this movement an anti-war movement an anti-capitalist movement. Thank you. Thank you very much again uh, to all of our panelists here tonight, some of which, as I said, had to leave earlier, to Danny Haifong, Arnold August, Sarah Flounders, Ken Stone, and Ali Yaravani. Also, thank you to Brendan Stone, uh, who has been helping behind the scenes on the Hamilton Coalition Against the War account, and to Tamara Hansen from Fire This Time, who's been helping with tech as well. Uh, thank you to Claudia and to Cynthia Merci for your work uh, during interpretations and for all that helped arrange the interpretation. It was a very important part of our webinar that the bulk of it was in French and English. Um, and also uh, really just a big thanks to all the sponsoring organizations and help everyone that helped build 
uh, this, this uh, important discussion, which is not over and must continue. So I look forward to the next time we will come together again. We absolutely did not get to everyone's comments or questions, not uh, you know, maybe a, a fifth, <laughs> despite our speaker's best efforts. I now question how we ever thought this could be done in two hours. So thank you for all the patience and, and our speakers for getting this done in three hours, which I think is also formidable. Um, the videos will be up soon and, and you should all receive links. Um, we're also going to go ahead and leave in the chat, or sorry, leave the webinar open for about five minutes um, after the event. And that will mean uh, that you all can copy and paste uh, the chat and get those important links that you might have missed, although we'll do our best to get them to you later as well. I think we can say united from this webinar that we are for peace in Ukraine. We are for a ceasefire and negotiations towards a peaceful outcome for both countries based on seeking a win-win result for Ukraine to become a militarily neutral nation to drop their military application to NATO, and especially for all tr NATO troops out of Ukraine. Thank you everyone again. Uh, from Canada, we say Canada out of NATO. Uh, from the US, uh, we unite and say US out of NATO. It's really uh, just been a great discussion and I appreciate all of your contributions and uh, announcements. It's a, it's a time when often I think we could feel that our voices against war are isolated under a great bombardment of propaganda that is pro-war with Russia. And I appreciate uh, that we have all come together tonight to combat this. Um, like I said, the chat will be open. Thank you again, everyone. Uh, great panel and discussion, and we will all be in touch very soon. Canada out of NATO, US out of NATO, no to war with Russia. Good night.